Okay. Um, welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. I'm so grateful uh, to our guest, Richard Foster, who's a Crystal Palace fan through and through, uh, for reminding us that this is the 10th anniversary, Tim, of what is commonly known as Christian Bull. <laughs> with the emphasis on the ball. No, no only kidding. Um, it is a match that I remember so well. Everybody who saw this match remember it because it was one of the biggest or the biggest shock turnarounds in Premier League history. Only 24 teams have managed to turn around a three-goal deficit. And Crystal Palace was one of those in the 20-something year history of, or nearly 30-year history of the Premier League, or over 30-year history of the Premier League now as it is, uh, 16,000 games or something like that in those Premier League years, only 0.2% of uh, teams have been able to do what Crystal Palace did. And guess who they did it to? Mark Machado. Mark Machado, <laughs> your boys took a hell of a draw. And I say this to you, Mark Machado, with no malice, you let a three-goal lead slip to Crystal Palace. Yeah. Oh, I like it. You've been working on this, haven't you, Tim? No, I just thought of it now because I remember Attila the Stockbroker. Doing, uh, <laughs> doing a Brighton fan. He, he, he often yes. used to do anti-Palace. And, and malice proves to be quite a good word. You know, there aren't that many. There aren't that many. Well, this this is yet another Alice chapter. Is the only thing in, I could think of. Indeed, Alice. yeah. Um, uh, it's in another chapter in this amazing rivalry between Liverpool and Crystal Palace. I and mean, it's a game that we looked at a while back where I, I was lucky enough to be there. It was the FA Cup semi-final from, from uh, 1990. Now, we're early in the season. Liverpool are beating Palace 9-0. Uh, in this semi-final at Villa, Villa Park, you think it's going to be the same for the first few minutes. And it's a yeah. dramatic turnaround and, and, and Palace end, end up winning. Um, the game this year, recently, which kind of ended Liverpool's Jurgen Klopp's farewell title hopes. Uh, and this is yet another one. Richard, come on down, introduce yourself and, and try and shed some bizarre light on this rivalry between Liverpool and Crystal Palace. Yeah, well, I'll be delighted to. Thank you for the invitation. I don't know where Mark is. He's probably hiding in the corner, curled up he in a ball. Yes. But, um, yeah, I was at the Villa Park game in 1990. As you said, it just felt as in the first half that we were just going to get hammered. I actually remember talking to my brother at half time in the lose and going, we're only 1-0 down. We might not get really badly exposed it might be three or four it'll be fine we're on national television it'll be okay we'll, we'll keep it down so you know ended up winning four three party scoring the winning goal but this game you know an fa cup semi-final is an amazing thing to be at especially for palace who haven't been in that many um this game i think what struck me most is actually i'd taken my daughter to school on the, it was a Monday and it was Monday afternoon I took it in Reading and do you know what I was thinking I was thinking can I really be bothered to slog back all the way down the M4 all the way through South London to Selhurst Park to watch a game that meant very little to us very little because we were already safe Tony Pulis who took over in November did an amazing job an amazing job under Ian Holloway, who I've always liked as a guy, we had gone eight games. We collected three points when we'd beaten Sunderland 3-1. We were bottom and well bottom. I think I saw we were 20-1 to 1 on to go down at that stage. And then under Pulis, he turned it round. And we got to the point where this was the penultimate game of the season and we were safe. I mean, it was ridiculous. Our Premier League history up to this point had been been in the Premier League four times, been relegated after each season. So to even just stay up was remarkable. And it was one of those really warm evenings. I don't, I know we don't get them that often, but it was a warm evening at Selhurst Park. And I just remember think, making that decision. It was a 50-50. I go, oh, I'll go. I'll go. I wasn't in the normal part of the ground. I normally sit in the main stand. I was in the white horse. 
so the smaller end. And I was on my own. Why, why weren't you in the Arthur? Early. No, 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 no. I have been in the Arthur many times, but I, I'm, I'm a bit old for the Arthur. It's, it's one be of the most surreal moments of football. You know, because Crystal Palace, they've got this stand named yeah. after Lord knows why, someone called Arthur Waite. Uh, and I've been in there and I've taken part in one of the more surreal football charts. We're the Arthur, we're the Arthur, <laughs> we're the Arthur over here. Yeah. So you weren't the Arthur on this occasion? No, Whitehorse. White Horse, <laughs> as the away fans call it, the Saints present, which, yeah, you know, yeah, I mean, that's right. Sure that's the away fans enjoy <laughs> giving us that, but you know, we're happy with the White Horse. So I'm in a, on my own and uh, just thinking, yeah, this, this will be fun. I'm very relaxed. So the game starts and Liverpool basically started quite well and they had a great team. Uh, but I was really struck by the fact that we conceded a goal from a corner, which we're quite good at doing. But but it was bloody Joe Allen. <laughs> yep. Joe Allen. The smallest Header, on the pitch. Joe yeah. Allen. <laughs> <laughs> no, you shouldn't be allowing it was, this. It was Joe a good Allen, move by him, though. That was his first Premier it League was. goal. It was a good header. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. he did have the freedom of South East 25, and there was no one marking him, so he could just. To, but uh, nobody expected Gerard, him. Maybe, maybe, maybe the Palace defenders thought that that was where the checkout was at the Sainsbury's end. <laughs> they left all that space. <laughs> now, Tim, you, you want to go back to the Arthur <laughs> Wake, you've got to be a bit more respectful. <laughs> exactly. Um, so it, it, it felt like. Liverpool clearly were going for the title. They did have a bit to, yeah, to do. What, what was the game situation? What was the goal difference? What was the title situation there? Um, this is the sixth of May, twenty fourteen. So, so coming towards the end of the season, where were Liverpool in this title yeah. running? Liverpool had just lost to Chelsea in the famous Gerrard slip game. So if you remember at Anfield when he slipped over and Denver Bar just trotted through and scored. And and then I think William scored the second. That was, uh, at that time, before the Chelsea game, they were on course to win the title. If they'd won all their three games, they'd have won it. So they lost to Chelsea. So that allowed Man City in, possibly. But Man City would have to win their games. The key to, to one of the aspects of this game, the Christian Bull game, is that, City had a goal difference advantage of, I think it was nine goals, OK? So Liverpool had to win this game, really, to put the pressure on City. And let's face it, after 55 minutes, they were going to win it. And I, I've listened to the commentary on this because 53 minutes in, um, Sturridge scores. It actually gets put down as an own goal to Delaney, which we'll come on to later. Um, and then Suarez gets... A, the third, a couple of minutes afterwards. So 55 minutes, Liverpool 3-0. And I think it's Tony Gale is the co-commentator. He said, this could be a really high score. The game's won. So we're just counting how many they're going to get. Yeah. And Suarez, I remember rushing in because he was right in front of me. He rushed into the net to get it back, to put it on the spot so they could increase their goal difference. So I'm thinking, you're slightly arrogant if you think that's going to happen. I mean, obviously, I didn't expect what to happen to happen, but just say, right, come on, we could get five, we can get six. So all very relaxed still, you know, you don't want to lose, but there was nothing on it for us. And then suddenly, somehow in the 79th minute, Damien Delaney went over the halfway line, which if I tell you, it happens about as frequently as Halley's Comet. Delaney yes. didn't really go forward and he certainly never hit a left foot shot from 25 yards into the top corner. Because usually when Damien Delaney pulled his leg back, all the people in rows there were going, oh no, don't hit me, don't hit me. And his The Delaney ball was quite a well-known thing amongst Palace fans because he just used to whack it. Sometimes it stayed in play, more often it ended in Rosette. So that, I, I did feel he hit that with some venom because he thought, don't put that down as an own goal against me. And Damien Delaney is one of those characters. He's a fiercely intelligent guy, but as a footballer, he took, he would never accept anything. He wouldn't stand down. Very famous occasion against Diego Costa when he was playing for Chelsea. Diego Costa did his normal 
pinch punch, you know, first of the month, whatever it might be. And Delaney just sort of turned around to me and said, mate, I've been going through all the leagues. I've been kicked to shit by Mansfield players. This is not impressing me. And there is a, a fantastic picture, if you can find it, of at one stage Delaney towering over Costa and Costa's going, no, don't, please. <laughs> but at the end of the game, this is what I heard from Kevin Day, who you'll know. Apparently, Costa came up to Delaney and said, that is the best game I've ever had against a centre-back. Because he gave it back to him rather than carrying away. Anyway, so Delaney is, is that man. <clears throat> Again, thinking like I did at Villa Park all those years before, that makes it slightly respectable. 3-1, you know, 10 minutes to go. We've shown our best. We haven't collapsed. Now, we had a young lad called Dwight Gale. Yes. Who had come on as a substitute. And he came on in the 65th minute. And Dwight Gale, he, we'd bought him from Peterborough for not very much money. And he was one of those players who had a huge amount of potential. He was, when he was on song, he was a deadly goal scorer. He, he wasn't on song that often. But tonight, this night, he was on song. So in the, uh, I think it was about the 81st minute, he suddenly gets laid up, laid in by uh, Yannick Balassi, who you'll remember, yeah. tricky winger. Amazing. Used to be off Fast. To Zaha. Zaha. Fast. Well, he's Everything. playing in Brazil now. Slightly mad. Yeah, yeah. He's playing, yeah, he's, is it Corinthians, is he? Chris Yuma. I think. Smaller than anyway, so yeah. He's, he's doing very well. He, he, yeah. Um, so anyway, there, there's Balassi setting him up 3-2. He's just thinking, oh, I wish we'd done this earlier. You know, if, if it... If we'd have actually pushed them, we might have got something out of this. And then blow me about five minutes later. And you've got to check this goal out because maybe a Delaney punt could be Scott Dan. But Glenn Murray, who'd also come in as a substitute, chested the ball to uh, Dwight Gale. And when I say chested, it's a huge, you know, to do that, I've tried it many times. I don't know if you guys have ever tried to chest it. (laughs) Normally, I just go like that. But these guys can just go bang and it went exactly into the path of Gale. And then Gale hit a left foot shot past Mignolet. Three all. Doton and Tim, I have, uh, apart from that Villa uh, Villa Park in that 90, I have never felt that giddy at a football match. It was just, oh my God, this has actually happened. And I just remember walking back to my car just kept shaking my head and just couldn't do, couldn't actually compute it because I just thought we've just done that. But the whole thing was we'd also ripped the rug from under Liverpool and we did it in 1990. And there is a bit of a theme here because actually the following season, uh, and you know, Liverpool didn't win the title, Man City won the title in this. The following season, Stephen Gerrard's final game at Anfield. So the last day of the following season. And everyone's expecting, oh, Palace are coming here. They're going to roll over. It'll be fine. And Liverpool went 1-0 up. And everyone thought, oh, great. Stevie G was going to have beaten 3-1. And Steve, Stevie wasn't happy. And he wasn't happy that night at Chris Ball either. Because if you remember, Suarez got a bit emotional at the end of the game because he thought, oh, we're going to win 6-0. Oh. Six goals, but it's three all, actually, Lewis, old boy. Um, and he was crying. He, he had his shirt over his head. He yeah. was crying. And Stephen Gerrard was concerned, as was Julian Speroni, as a good, you know, Argentinian to Uruguay. But Gerrard was consoling him. And I remember very clearly the TV camera, camera came up and Gerrard pushed him away. I said, go away. Which I sort of get, because you don't want to be prying into someone who's having a bad time. Mind you, with Louis Suarez, I'm not that bothered. Um, so there it was. From absolutely nowhere, we got a 3 or draw. And I do also remember reading Matthew Said in the Times the next day saying, this is why English football is one of the greatest, um, you know, greatest places Spectacles. to watch it. Because Crystal Palace had nothing. Nothing on this game. They're three nil down. Why would they even bother? But no, they kept bothering and they bothered Liverpool. And in the end, 
upset. I, I watched the game on on Brazilian TV, and they came to they made exactly the same conclusion that the they? whole thing was mm. magical, and with nothing in the game, with no skin in the game. No. The point that they were making, and I think it's a valid one, was that this wasn't just a triumph, a draw, of the Crystal Palace team. It was one of the fans as well. It was the the atmosphere in the stadium, and Crystal Palace yeah. is 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 one of the worst Premier League grounds. Uh, mm-hmm. In well, you could mo- say that in, mo- I mean, it's, in it's modern hard. architectural terms. <laughs> true, true. But it, in the last few years, it's great it really, for reggae yeah. concerts. Yes, yeah, maybe, it, no. but it really has been kicking, isn't it, in the, in the last few years? Uh, and you could feel that bond. And in yeah. the same way, I saw Arrigo Saki talk about Istanbul. Mm-hmm. And Chilotti was the Milan coach when Liverpool came back. And they're mates and they're talking. And Saki was saying it was a triumph for the culture of English football because it's 3 0 at half time. Liverpool are three down, and there's, the, the fans are still singing. They're still yeah. there, they're still in the game. And it's a similar thing with the yeah. Crystal Palace. And is, is this one of the last home games of the season? So that's a special event anyway, isn't it? But I it think any game, game Crystal, yeah. Yeah, any game in recent years at Crystal Palace, there's been people there dedicated to creating an atmosphere. Definitely. Yeah, well, the Homesdale Fanatics who, you know, they started life just after we got out of administration in 2010. So there was this, I mean, Palace spent a long time not really going anywhere. So this was, you know, this 2013-14 season, so we'd been out of the top flight for eight years. And as I said, the previous four Premier League seasons, we dropped out after each season. So there was <clears throat> there was this sense that once we saved ourselves from administration, which was a very, very tight call, you know, literally, <clears throat> the owners were at Lloyd's Bank, there were fans protesting outside, it could have gone either way. A bit like I could have said when I was in Reading, I can't be bothered to go to this game, but stuck with it. And it it became a bit more of a thing, just not to accept things, but let's make it into an experience. It, let's get behind the team. Let's make sure they know, because we could have lost our club. So we need to celebrate the fact that we may not be going anywhere, but at least we're having fun not going anywhere. And lo and behold, it did become one of the best atmospheres. Um, and the other people joined in. So the Arthur joined in. We are the Arthur. Homesdale joined. <laughs> but I've got to say, put it down to the Homesdale fanatics. They did, you know, they organised display. And let's face it, lots of teams have followed their lead. So Arsenal, the Ashburton Army, whatever they're called, that is absolutely a replica of what Palace have done because mm. they wear black shirts, they've got the, they've got the megaphones. Da, da, da. And, you know, you've, you, Tim, you've seen a lot of orchestrated fan stuff in Brazil and it happens all over the, the world. Didn't used to happen so no. much in England, did it? it no, it wasn't, it wasn't part of our fan chanting. culture, was it? Yeah. No, not at all. So this is something that I'm really proud of as a Palace fan is that has turned around. We're not, as loud as we were because we're now coming up to our 12th season consecutively in the Premier League. It's like, what? We're an established Premier League side. This doesn't make sense. I mean, we'd only been in the top flight before this 2013 4 season in total 10 seasons, right? So now we are going to be about to approach our 12th consecutive season in the top flight. That is a massive thing. In my lifetime, you know, that has never happened. Uh, you know, I, I'm old enough to remember us getting promoted to the old first division in 1969-70. So this is just beyond the realms of dreams because everyone goes, oh, isn't it a bit boring? You see, <laughs> you're going to finish between, I mean, the top we've ever finished in the Premier League is 10th. And the lowest we've ever been in these last 11 years, I think, is 15th. We've always been between 41 and 49 points every single season. So everyone's going, oh, isn't it a bit dull? No, I'd rather be doing this than travelling away with all due respect to Hull on a Tuesday night. So I quite enjoy being in the Premier League. And I know a lot of people are very sniffy about the Premier League. I don't think it's the greatest league in the world. Certainly one of the most popular, if not the most popular. And it's just good because you can take on Liverpool 
and you can beat them at Anfield. You can take on Man City and draw with them. You can, you know, you can do these things, and it's a great thing to savor because I'm used to scraps, and now I'm beginning to have, you know, a decent meal on the table quite regularly. And I just, I, I absolutely love it. And I said to my son, he's only 23. He said, "Really take this in because." At some stage, we will get relegated. It's almost inevitable because we're not a big enough club to survive. So just take this in, enjoy it. Uh, I've got to say, right now, Oliver Glasner, blown my Amazing. mind with what he's done. Amazing. Blown my mind. But going back to, I know we should be focusing on uh, the three all from the 5th of May 2014. I mean, when I looked at the lineups, it's all connected, thinking, by the way. How it's all connected. I would say that what's yeah, happening today, forgive me for interrupting. I would say, no, 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 today, I like being interrupted at, at Crystal. Well, you know me, I'm a Charlton supporter, so I'm not going to love you lot too yes. much, but I will say, oh, well. <laughs> you're a, you're, you're a for, <laughs> former tenant of uh, exactly, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. Also, yeah. and also, Arsenal were tenants at Selhurst Park as well, don't forget. So when you talk about them absorbing some of your fan culture, I can probably understand why. But, you know, very crucially, I see, as we speak now, one week away from you defeating uh, Manchester United 4-0, I was in Mexico when I got this text. I mean, I couldn't stop laughing. But that aside, then you come back, and I've known all season, by the way, I've known for the last two seasons, Michael Elise has been my favourite player, actually, in the Premier League. When he mm -hmm. got injured, he struggled, as you know. And you, yeah. Him and Eze getting injured at the same time. But what I was going to say was Crystal Palace, it's all connected because Crystal Palace have had this, even though you could argue you're a mid-table club, you've had this tendency of bringing forward amazing individual players. Uh, and, Yannick, and often, often South London, local lads. As well. Very yeah. South one of your London favorite, club, isn't it? One of your favourite players, yeah. Tim, Jason Punchin, is in this yeah. match. Yeah, he's in this players. match. You forget about him because Crystal Palace have brought on another generation and another generation mm. or a couple of players each time. At the moment, your front three, if the front three is Mateta, Olise and Eze, they're as sharp and as good mm -hmm. as probably any other front three. Maybe not as effective, but they're as sharp and as good, in my view, as any other front three in the Premier League at the moment. And when you look at this um, front three that you've got here, you just forget how good Yannick Blassi <laughs> was yeah. and how mm -hmm. they'd already invented chance about him when he went to Everton. Even though yeah. he got injured quite early on, they had the chance already mm. in place for him because yeah, yeah. you could see him going like a train. When he goes past a player, and as as you saw for one of the goals, he, um, I think one of the Dwight, the first Dwight girl goal. When he goes mm. past a player, yeah. he can he can side foot them so wide and still catch up with the ball and still be ahead of them as he goes towards the goal. He's like a train. He's yeah. like a machine throughout mm -hmm. this game. But you, you already mentioned Spironi, great goalkeeper in any case. Little, of a, little guy. Yeah, little guy. quite Too small, guy. I think, yeah. to be top class. Not a didn't six come... foot five guy. He mm, should little be. Guy. Yeah. Little guy. <laughs> little but, guy. <laughs> yes, he was a little guy. You made the <laughs> point. And then you look at the Liverpool... Uh, a Mignolet in, in goal for Liverpool mm -hmm. used to be one of the best goalkeepers in the Premier League. So to let three in by him, you've got to look at the defence. Arguably, in this three all, Glenn Johnson is yeah. the weak link in Liverpool. Once Crystal Palace sussed that out in the second mm -hmm. half, that he, hasn't he, got the he disappears against Gale, doesn't he? It's embarrassing, mm -hmm. I think. When I look at it, I'm thinking Crystal Palace kept lobbing the ball over to their left side because Glenn Johnson was opposite yeah. them on, in the Liverpool defence. Yeah, I think you're right. I think Skirtle also has a bit of a nightmare. And oh, after one of the goals, can't remember, he just he does the swipe and goes, oh my God, what have I done? Yes. Um, you're right yes. about Belassi. Belassi famously did a 360 turn against Tottenham once, which all everyone in the crowd just went, what has he just done? He literally just spanned like that. And the, everyone just went, how do you do that? He also did this... I remember him doing this at Anfield, actually. I can't remember which game, where he's sort of he's, he's juggling, and then he puts his hand on the turf by the ball, 
And the defender's just going, what? And then he just spins away and off he goes. But he had that strange ability to... People just froze in front of him because they thought, I'm not quite sure what you're doing. And, and it's a sort of head-scratching moment. And then he's away. Um, but no, fabulous player and so unlucky. I mean, when he went to Everton, I thought he's going to kick on. But he got injured and, and that he has never really recovered from that. And it's... It's very sad, but also you've got to think about this team. We just come up via the playoffs, and actually, eleven years ago today was the game you mentioned Brighton. So I'm sure Attila, the stockbroker, will love this. We beat them two nil at the Amex. Um, Wilfred Zahar had such a good game, scored both goals in front of the Palace. And but remember, he was only on loan to us from Man, from Man United. United. Hmm. But your player. He, he was going to move, and he did in the summer after he won the penalty when we beat Watford in the playoff final. He was Alex Ferguson's last signing. And then David Moyes took over, and I'm not going to go into scurrilous rumours, but Wilf and David Moyes did not get on. He didn't really play him. He then went on loan to Cardiff. But he was, you know, we're thinking... Without Wilf, we're going to have absolutely no chance. I mean, Balassi was great, but he was a counter to Wilf. And we're just thinking, well, who are we going to bring in? And if you remember Ian Holloway, let's say, loved him, interviewed him a few times, the most quotable manager ever. And, you know, as a journalist, that's what you're going to love, a quotable person. But he, he did some sort of supermarket sweep at the beginning of the season where he bought every person that was going. It's a bit like Forrest a couple of seasons ago. Everyone, just bring them in, bring them in, bring them in. But none of them really fitted. And and you look at that team that played that night against Liverpool, six of them were from the side that had come up from the championship. But Pulis had bought in January, so when he took over in November, he did Pulis signing. So he bought Scott Dan, solid. Joe Ledley, super solid. And your man, Jason Punchin. So of these, three of those are in this team. And all three made a massive contribution to turning the fortunes around. So rather than being 20 to 1 on to go down, we suddenly turn into a half-decent side. And all of those players contributed a huge amount to turning that season round. Like if, if, if Mark were here, rather than <laughs> cowering somewhere under the settee, he would probably make the point um, that this is the moment when Klopp becomes a possibility for Liverpool because had Brendan Rodgers won the title, then he's he's booked in for bed and breakfast for a while. And but So so this is a decisive moment there. And you look at the Liverpool lineup, and you look at the way that Liverpool perform and you think, oh yeah, Van Dijk, Alisson. <laughs> you know, that's two yeah. places where Klopp, right, we're going to sort that out. Uh, yes, so we're, yeah. we're not we're, we're not going to go go through this this again. So it's the old story, you know. On the path to victory, failure is always a huge part of the story, isn't it? And Liverpool failing on this occasion is part of them succeeding later on. Absolutely, and you know, no one is perfect, so you're going to make mistakes, and you need to learn it's from good mistakes. Line and from film, yeah. Possibly. Um, but I, I have actually spoken right to Mark him. about this. And you're right, Tim. He says this is the beginning of the Klopp era because you quite rightly point out if they'd gone on to win the title, then Rogers would have been enshrined at Anfield and Klopp would have left Dortmund and wouldn't have turned up at Anfield. So where would he have gone? We don't know. I would also like to point out, I'm going to really piss off a lot of Liverpool fans here, Mark, sorry about this, that Klopp's first loss for Liverpool, guess who that was against? Hmm. Oh, yeah, it was against Palace, 2 1 at Anfield, when he called, <laughs> I cannot believe we lose to fucking Crystal Palace in a press conference. <laughs> do you know do you know who is likely to be the last team to win at Anfield under Klopp? Uh oh. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> it's Crystal Palace. We beat Famous the one last last word. Great goal by Ezra. There's only one more game yeah. to go. They've got That's Wolves at home on the final day of the season. Sure. I think sure. they're likely to win that. So <clears throat> we have been their bogey side 
But up mm. to this point, I mean, we beat them in the semi-final. We had been hammered by Liverpool, as you say, 9-0 that season. They beat us 7-0 at Selhurst. They generally, I think Klopp, under Klopp, they, they beat us 10 times in a row in the Premier League. Not even a draw, 10 times. But there had just been those odd moments where basically we had pissed on their chips. So we did it for Chris Ball. We did it for Gerard's last game. We also did it, we broke the record when they won at, and hadn't been beaten at Anfield for three seasons or something. Then we did it. And I, I checked this out. So under clock, Liverpool, guess how many Liverpool, guess how many games they've lost at Anfield just in the Premier League in the Klopp era. So that's from 2015-16 to this moment. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's nine seasons. Guess how many times they've lost at Anfield and Premier League? 15. It's not bad. Dawson, you're going to have a guess? Uh, Higher. Guess that's not Higher. bad. No, no, I'm going to go lower, 12. 12 is exactly... You be, you're, you're looking at 11 versus 11, genius. aren't you? Uh, I'm a genius. Not cheating. I'm a genius. No, yeah, no, so no. It's 12 oh, times. No, no, genuinely. Mate, give me credit. Would I? Would I lie to you? I do not no. cheat. No, trust me. I, I mean, no, I, I know all Charlton fans are as honest as the day is long, so don't... And I know you wouldn't do that. So 12 times... 12 and times, how many of them of are those, Christmas? by the way, would you do that? Well, we're, we're going to get on to that, Tim. I need to give you the back. Yeah. Um, six of those were during that weird COVID period when they lost to Burnley, Brighton, Man City, Everton, Chelsea and Fulham. But it was COVID. It was unusual weird. So if we take those six out because it was so weird, they've lost six times in those seasons. I'm going to tell you now, three of those losses at Anfield have been to Crystal Palace. So Klopp's first one, we then did it again the following season when Benteke scored twice to, uh, again, piss them off. And then recently, obviously, in April this season, beaten 1-0. So, you know, having had, having Liverpool generally beating us fairly hollowly, you know, without any trouble, we've now become their bogey side, which I quite like. Um, and I'm sure Mark, once he's got out of the cruel position... <laughs> will appreciate that, you know, we're there just to provide entertainment and just make sure that when you do have success, you really savour it. See, your podcast what? is called It Starts You With A Kick, whereas you yes. should really call it It Started With A Kicking. Um, <laughs> and invite, invite right, Martin Machado to come and uh, reference. I was going to say, we've all identified the weakness of Liverpool in defence. Mm-hmm. That season, they got they let in three goals um, against some teams that they should have beaten, or they did beat, but nevertheless, you know, they were um, this I've got up here. Uh, they beat Cardiff City 6 3. Mm -hmm. They won against Swansea City 4 3, uh, okay. and they won at Stoke City 5 3. This team there's a theme was, here, isn't there, I think there's, there's a, theme. a little theme mm -hmm. going on here, which they didn't expect when they took on Crystal Palace. Like you said earlier on, Luis Suarez, when he scores his goal, he's grabbing the ball off the Crystal Palace defender. Like, mate, this is a five yeah. side. It's who can <laughs> score as many goals as possible that wins. Yeah. He was a little bit cheeky Absolutely. there, but I'm not knocking yeah. Suarez. Others may. At the end of the match, all of this comes into a kind of a moment, a dramatic moment where, as you said, Luis Suarez crying, well, we can't even see his face because his face is the entire mm. time. So if you think like five minutes on the pitch, he's got his shirt over his head. What's going on in the stands with the Palace fans? Because obviously Christmas has come early for you lot, hasn't it? Yeah, as I said, it's one of those giddy moments. I mean, I didn't at the time appreciate Suarez was having a meltdown because you don't really, you know, the game's over. Um, you know, I've got to get back to, you know, North London. So I'm thinking, right, well, I, I've really loved this. 
we obviously were cheering the side because it was the last home game. What a fantastic home game. Uh, and then I wasn't really focused on Lou Suarez. I was more focused on Dwight Gale and Damien Delaney. And it it's, it's odd, isn't it? When you were at an amazing game, which other people watch on television, they see far more of it than you do because mm-hmm. you're in the stands, you know, you, you're – Focus might be elsewhere. I mean, I'm not one of these people. I hate people going on the phone whilst the game's going on. If you want to go on the phone, don't come to a football match because that's not what you should be doing. Yeah, it's horrible. Um, but you just don't get the, you know, you don't get the camera going into Suarez's face and Gerard pushing away mm-hmm. because you're in the stands. So it's, you know, if you have a great game like that, and I must admit, I've watched the 1990 semi-final back, I think three times in its entirety, because it was so ridiculous. John Pemberton's run in the first minute, of the second half, bang, bang, um, But you just don't get that, the closeness, because you're celebrating and then you're leaving the ground. And mm. there are two things I'd like to point out here to all your listeners, is A, I took that decision when I was in Reading to go for it. So if you're 50-50, and you think it's not worth going, go. The other thing is, which I have instilled in my son, is you never, ever, ever leave a game early, ever. It's just no, it's a no-no. So I would imagine that at 3-0 down, with only just over 10 minutes to go, there could have been some Palace fans leaving. And in the end, those fans that left missed one of the greatest comebacks ever. So sit through it when you're 4-0 down. Because if you sit through it when you're 4-0 down, you will appreciate it when you do that extraordinary thing, which will happen what, once in a blue moon. Were you in the ground for the Cantona game a decade earlier? Yep, I was actually in the stand. At the, then I was in the main stand and the Cantona incident happened right in front. But again, right. So you, could you I see there, that? I didn't realise it. I saw right. there was a kerfuffle because I'm at the back and obviously he jumps in the front. So I didn't see exactly what happened. And this is a long time ago. And I, I maybe I was in the car, so I listened to the radio. But then I got back for the BBC News at 10 or whatever it was. And it was the front story. I'm going, hang on a minute. I need to see this yeah. again. And yeah. then you get the TV coverage. You go, Oh, so what he's done is he jumped in and done a kung fu kick. Of course, yeah. So <laughs> I was there, but again, I didn't get the close up, and I, I, I learned more from seeing the television pictures. And other mm. people said, "Oh, did you see that?" And I said, "Yeah," but I didn't see it. See it. So you lose out on the specifics, yeah. but in the ground, in the ground, you get two things: you get the whole pitch, so you get the entire yes. panorama. But also, and crucially, the crucial difference is you get the emotion. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, you're with fellow fans, so it's all there. Yeah. You know, we've all been at games where we've ended up in the arms of someone we don't know very well, oh, yeah, um, yeah. just through sheer joy. And, you know, you, it's that awkward thing where suddenly the elation wears off. Go, oh, sorry about that. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> I didn't mean to hug you. Um, but, but that's the beauty of football is the the emotion and the bond is so important. And I think, you know, we're all, we're all of an age, if I can chuck us in the same group, where some of the modern football seems a bit anodyne. Some of it seems a bit corporate. And I think that's actually, you know, that's where I almost prefer going down the leagues. Because I think if you go down the leagues, it's more of a, real experience rather than this rather sanitised version that you can get in the Premier League. Uh, again, I'm not saying I want us to go down the league because I quite enjoy being in the Premier League, but there is something, you know, uh, don't, I sh- I'm assuming you still go to the Valley, so there must be moments where you go, ah, oh, this is it, we're, we're coming back again, which unfortunately you haven't for yourselves. But <laughs> no, <we're not. laughs> you, you do still have the moments where, you, you know, there is that solidarity. And as I say, the Palace atmosphere has been very well known, but it is slightly, it's, it's slightly petering out. I mean, it's still there, but it's not as it was in its height when we thought, Jesus, 
we've lost our club. This needs to be celebrated when we saved it. And, you know, when you've been in the Premier League for 11 seasons, it becomes a little bit, you know, oh, we've done this before, this is fine. So uh, my advice to everyone is always go to a game if you're 50-50. Never, ever leave one, even if it's going really badly wrong, because it will turn around one day and you'll appreciate it. Um, so, and the live experience, whatever angle you get on television is so much better. And, you know, as you say, Tim, I think the key is you can see the whole pitch. And also, you're not at the behest of the the director. So the director might move on to something, whereas when you're watching it in real life, you take it all in. You see other players moving and space developing. That's all part of watching football, isn't it? Because you want to see the whole picture and not just the edited bits. I hope this doesn't sound like the wrong analogy, but it's like going to the movies uh, as opposed to watching a film at home. When you leave a football match, you're buzzing. Whatever has happened, you are buzzing because you know you've experienced uh, a spectacle. You know, you even, even like it. being able to stop the traffic outside the ground. It's great. Even that's brilliant. Yeah. You know, it's hang on. Yeah. These, these streets belong to us now. <laughs> exactly. Not for long. For yeah. 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 And there's a long walk, yeah, right. you know, as you know, uh, from Tottenham. It's different if you go to the Valley or Crystal Palace, which I know really well, by the way. Uh, the Selman's smell of onions. Mark, I know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Although you don't smell it as much now. And the last time I went to a football match, which was only. That's an outrage. Uh, an outrage. It, no, trust me, it, it was Barnet. Was it, yeah, it was Barnet okay. that I went to uh, with my little uh, step grandson, and we could smell the onions. And I said, "Come on, come on, you know, let's go and get some." Mm -hmm. It was the <laughs> worst flipping decision I ever made. First no, you don't want to eat it; out. you just want to smell it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fair really enough. Wrong. Yeah, you got a good point there. <laughs> got a good point. A uh, couple of things. Well, one thing in particular, and please don't take this the wrong way. I, I don't mean it in any sort of way other than. Um, you know, Richard, trust me, other than you can't avoid this, this season, last couple of seasons, Crystal Palace have been a black team, mate. Come on. It's been a black team. With all due respect uh, South to London team, Will Hughes. It? Will Hughes has done an excellent job at breaking up the play of the opposition in midfield for you and actually setting up one or two decent attacks. But you mm -hmm. have, have you noticed this? Have you noticed this yourself? Or is it me extrapolating a bit too much from what I see? No, it's, uh, you, you're absolutely right. And as Tim says, South London, uh, it was once called the Concrete Catalonia because it had it had actually produced the most Premier League players because, you know, Jaden Sancho is from South London. Eberechi Eze originally was in South London and, you know, he ended up at QPR. Elise, you know, they're, they're, they're nearly all from this amazing catchment area. And, you know, it's a very diverse, mixed um, community. But the other thing you have to bear in mind is the, the cage football, which I'm sure you're both aware of. Cage football is a massive thing in South London. So rather than playing on a pristine pitch, you are playing on a fucking hard bit of concrete with fencing around you. And that is a tough place to learn football. So if you can play decent football in a South London cage, you're probably going to be okay on one of the most beautifully manicured pitches across the Premier League, wherever it might be. So, yes, we do have a strong representation of black players. And I think it's great. And it's I think it should be, you know celebrated um you know unfortunately the crowd is probably not as proportionally the same mm. I've, I've, I've often I've felt that there, the times that, that i've been there um but yeah. it, I, I suppose in a way and vince hilaire is a pioneer of this isn't he hello exactly. hello yeah, yeah, hello he... as the song went <laughs> yeah i mean hilaire was one of my early heroes just a beautiful player dancing through mm. everyone red and blue sash you know all that sort of stuff so We've always had a fair record, but we're now, you know, I, I think it's great. And, and I, I don't, see, I don't even see colour anymore, really. I, I don't sort of think, oh, well, I mean, Hughes is weird because he looks like an albino because he's such, you know, white hair. Um, 
and interestingly, you mentioned, you know, he's been good like in the last... Do you love Charlie and Dowie? Uh, I don't think Ian Dowie has a love child, does he? But if he was, if he did, he'd be your man. But... Um, she uses an interesting did that very example. well, I must admit. You got us out of jail <laughs> she... very, very well there. Yeah, good. She was... You see, when he was playing under Hodgson, he didn't get many minutes and everyone said, oh God, Hughes is coming on. This is going to be a disaster. We're going to concede a last minute goal, which we did a lot. Um, but then under Glasner, he's turned into suddenly a really, really good, solid player. I mean, he's never going to be Maradona, but he's good and he doesn't give the ball away. And it's exactly what you need in midfield. You, you pass it to the flair player. So you get it to Lisa, you get it to Ezra. Off you go. You don't need to do anything fancy. Um, Unfortunately, got injured quite badly against Wolves at the weekend. But he's an example of how Glasner has turned this club round with remarkable, remarkable speed. I, I, I literally have never seen such a transformation. And Roy Hodgson, love him to bits. I just thought he'd actually was, you know, he fell ill twice during this season. Once in September when we were about to play Villa. And then more recently, and I thought, actually, you're not doing your health any good and you don't need to do this because you're 76 years old. You've proved you're a brilliant manager. OK, so maybe he didn't have the greatest time at Liverpool, maybe he had the greatest time at England. But he, you know, the, the, the work he did at Palace when he took over from Frank de Boer and lifted us up and got us, you know, four consecutive seasons should always be recognised. Not the most exciting football in the world, but then again, you've got to be practical. Now, towards the end of the Hodgson era, everyone just thought, yes, we just lost our oomph. Elise and Eze were injured, so that is understandable, so you lose. But Glasner has turned around Hughes. He's turned around Klein, who's become an excellent player. He was an excellent again, player at Liverpool. Again, obviously. yeah. Again. And, and you know... There are Mateta, who wasn't really firing on all cylinders, scored the odd brilliant goal and then kicked a corner flag. He's kicking the corner flags on regular, regular occasions now. So, I, I mean, you would know probably more about Glasner's background than I do. And I, I know where, you know, he was at Wolfsburg and he was at um, Eintracht Frankfurt and in Austria as well. But my word, as I said, I've never seen a transformation. The team seems united. They seem to know what they're doing and they're playing bloody good footballs, which is... Nice to see. His commentary, and it's so interesting. Uh, we've been <clears throat> talking about this particular match uh, against Liverpool, and yeah. post match analysis is always um, an interesting thing, particularly from the coach. So we're talking about the 6th of May 2014, Crystal Palace mm -hmm. versus. Liverpool, known as Chris Bull. After the match, Brendan Rodgers, the Liverpool coach at the time, um, he states the obvious that, I mean, to be fair, in response to a question by a journalist about the mood mm -hmm. in the uh, dressing room, and he says people are devastated. But what I couldn't figure out was he does not take responsibility. At some point, at 3-0 down, they should have shut up shop. Certainly at 3-1 down, they should have shut up shop. At 3-2 down, all 11 Liverpool players should have been in front of goal. And yet they're trying to do what they think they need to do to put pressure on Manchester City. The pressure's already on Manchester City if you get the three points. Mm. And they lose two points as a result of this. And I couldn't see what Brendan Rodgers was doing all that time. He needed to say, I made a mistake. OK, he had 18 months left to go on his contract. But I think even in this post-match analysis, you can see him doing what you said earlier on, Tim, thinking, right, OK, uh, I've, I've won the league. Uh, or or well, he, you can see him thinking, I've lost the league and I've lost my opportunity to be the Liverpool manager for the next... Um, no, I think his, his problem is that the two goal, the first two goals happen so quickly. So that context Ooh. changes because at one point they are thoroughly justified in thinking 3-0 isn't good enough. We can get more here. We can improve our goal difference position. Yeah. And yeah. within two minutes, 
you go from that position to we need we need to get out out of here with the three points and <clears throat> yeah. the reset and again the atmosphere comes into play because you get those moments mm. towards the end of football games when people are tired, their brains are a little bit frazzled. You put them under the pressure of the baying home, Homesdale army, uh, uh, really finding full voice. Uh, and that's a much, can you do what you could do in other situations then? You know, 85 minutes into a game when yeah. suddenly things are going, are going against you. Can you can you suddenly change then? It's not it's not for everyone that what that one really isn't. You know, it, 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 that that is a lot like trying to change the car, change the tire on a car that's going sixty miles an hour. It's not easy. No, no, and you're absolutely right. And actually, I did sense it in the crowd at three two. I just thought actually something's happening here, and it was almost like an ineluctable force. This was going to happen. But I think you're right, Dayton. Isn't that where the manager has to step up to the plate? Because he can see his players are panicking yeah. a bit. As you yeah. say, Tim, two goals in the space of three minutes. You go, oh, you know, totally in control to careering down the hard shoulder with a, you know, you know, burst tyre. So that is surely, I think, between the manager and the captain and senior players, you go, well, well you need, as you said, to you need a reset. We need to actually get back into this because we've been cruising and now we're not cruising. We need to do something different. Yeah, it's, it's one of those really, times when what you really need doing it. is you need your goalkeeper to go down injured, strategic injury. Just yeah. just take the heat out of the game, right? So that just that just switches the momentum a little bit. So that that I think, I mean, when Brazil had that disaster against Germany in the fight and the semi final, just a couple of months mm -hmm. after this, that's one of the things that post match that was one of their rationalisations. Why didn't the goalkeeper just go down, spend five minutes on the floor and give us some breathing space? Yeah, but it's hard because everything's happening too quickly. You know, so much of yeah. top level sport, it's about the management of time, isn't it? You know, when you're at, when you're on the in, in the wonderful phrase of of uh, the Dutch goalkeeper uh, uh, Tim Crew, when you're at the top of your game, uh, he said the Premier League, you always have to be at the top of your game. When you are you, mm. you're at the top of your game, you are in control of the time. When you're not, everything's yeah. happening too quickly, and the impression you have is that everything was happening too quickly for Liverpool in those last ten minutes. I feel that Liverpool should have respected Crystal Palace more. You win a game 3-0. You can't ask much more than that from your players. You're right, Tim. They're absolutely within their right to try and bang in as many as possible. But that's where the disrespect comes in. In the Premier League, you think that, oh, you know, it's like the old Kevin Keegan thing, you know, um, we'll score more than them. But you're taking it to the level of a piss take. 3-0 is already a credible score if mm. manchester united sorry, manchester city can do better than that they've got a better goal difference than accept it. of course if you can if it was one goal difference banging four five or arguably six against man city if i if i recollect correctly wouldn't have quite matched man city i think man city were like nine goals they were nine up nine on goal difference yeah you see what i mean so how many do you think you're going to get against crystal yeah. palace to level that up that's just piss yeah. take but anyway th that aside there is a soundtrack as you well know richard when you go to crystal palace uh, you do like your music there you're glad all over aren't you and that's a, a yeah. tottenham chant that you lot have nicked you must admit that yeah it's a have you no hang on hang on, hang on doton 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 <laughs> Dave Clark was a Tottenham fan. Okay, that's yes. fine. Yeah, it's I Tottenham can't sound. remember at White Hart Lane them singing "Glad All Over." No, you didn't get the. Would, would anyone? Would anyone really want to sing "Glad All Over"? No. Now, it also, always, I'll always point leaves me out. In bits and pieces every time I hear it. <laughs> Very good, um, but "Glad All Over" has been adopted by quite a few clubs, and yes. I would yes. throw in a, a club called Man City. Who do the Guardiola? Yeah, da, da, yeah, of course, Guardiola. Of so, of 
Man anyway, City aren't a bad team, and they're nicking our stuff, so they'll probably nick and, a few of our players. But well, anyway. Tottenham have nicked the when the Saints go marching in off Southampton, yeah, where exactly. it rightfully exactly. belongs. Uh, anything to say in your defence, Tim? Uh, no, I do like. Um, it's one of my favourite things about you know I don't obviously can't go very much these days, but I love the fact that at half time yeah. for the second half the team come out to to Jim Max band. Oh, my name is McNamara. I'm the leader of the band. <laughs> it's one of my favourite things. You know, so these little things of being there that you miss if you're just watching it watching it on on TV. As we always do, Richard, we take a look at the soundtrack of the moment, um, which contains so- nothing about Ron Node's mother. Oh. It's a very popular theme for Tim, Crystal Palace fans. Ron yeah, Node's mother, for some reasons yeah. that I've never entirely yeah. understood. Yeah. Apparently um, the Pope has uh, has some opinions about Ron there was, Yeah, there was a certain Catholicism oh, involved in it, wasn't there? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So the 6th of May... <laughs> God, guys. Anyway... <laughs> It's not even funny. Six of May, <laughs> two thousand and four. No, one of my favourites because it, it it ends with you know uh, 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 it's a whore, uh, yes, and then you get paused, yes. and, and then you get yeah. oh the whole, <laughs> and then people saying th- things like slag or <laughs> lady yeah. of the night. Uh, and the last time I was there, I really wanted. I wish I kind of wish I'd done it. Just after a discreet pause to sing, leading member of the world's oldest profession, just to see how that would go down. <laughs> That's a bit too clever. It's a little uh, bit long. I'm not, I don't yeah, think exactly. it's going to catch on, but I get you. I get your drift. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so I, yeah. I got told it's too niche, as was my comment the other day. That uh, the great thing that your new coach has done has been to split up the Mississippi Burning defensive partnership of Mr. Ward and oh. Mr. Anderson. Because if you know the film, they do come to blows. So that's what he's done. He's obviously watched Mississippi Burning and decided that Mr. Okay. Ward and Mr. Anderson should not be in the same defensive lineup. Okay, I, have, I, I haven't told seen the film, niche. but I, I know where you're coming from. I mean, that's the one thing I'd like to also throw back to this game. Joel Ward was playing in that game and he's playing now, which is quite, quite impressive. That's amazing. No, I can't see any other per- Raheem Sterling was playing for Liverpool. And he's no longer at Liverpool. But Joel Ward, what a servant. You know, came mm. up with us and he's still with us. And he's got a year extension again because under Glasner he's rejuvenated because he's not hanging around with the Joachim Manson. Yeah, brilliant. So the um, music, so, sorry, yeah. back to the music, Toto. Sorry, that was a slight... Um, yeah, that's all right. Sorry. No, no, that's all right. Because Tim doesn't want to talk about the music, but I do because <laughs> at number one is Calvin <laughs> Harris with Summer and Calvin Harris, a Liverpool okay. fan, a Liverpool right. official DJ or as close as they get, um, and led the Liverpool team in a celebration. I think after Istanbul, wherever it was, you know, he showed up and gave them a free gig. He's at number one. What do we think? Mm, no not comment? my favourite Calvin Harris song. I, I don't okay. have many favourite Calvin Harris songs, but that's not my favourite. Well, I, I hate that gonna go orchestration in, oh. thing. You know, that, that, ah. that orchestra, that kind of... It reminds me of like one of that Rolf Harris instruments that he was selling, that orchestration <laughs> thing that the, the, the at this time the DJs the were doing a lot of like, do, 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 no, no, take it away. Do you know why? It was because DJs or discotheques or clubbing had uh, morphed into these huge venues in right. the Balearic yeah. Islands. Yeah. So you're talking about going to... Yeah. I, I it works in a stadium. Yeah. yeah, in those stadium mm. DJs, you know, or t- stadium discotheques. Um, and you've got to make it loud. You've got to make it high energy. Big and well. epic. And, yeah. And yeah. there's quite a few songs in the charts which are of that mold. Yeah. This was their that's moment, that's, a, that's a brilliant take, that. That's the DJ Go Stadium, which changes the music. It's brilliant. Indeed. Yeah. So they, they create a Premier League of their own, if you like, um, because DJs were just some bloke that spun the records. You could go up and talk to them once upon a time because they're only a few inches away from the dance floor. But now they're up there on a stage themselves. They are the stars of the moment yeah. and the music that they have. What happens invariably in music is when music takes on, even from the days of the Beatles, you can see that, but even before, you could go back to the days of the 1920s or 30s 
when you have somebody like Big Joe Turner, great blues shouter, known for blues shouter, did the original Shake, Rattle and Roll before, um, well, in your terminology, uh, William Halley, Bill Halley and his comets went and ruined it. Well, you, you, oh. you mentioned about Halley's comets earlier. Well, it was Halley's comet, but Bill Halley's yeah, the I know, person, yeah. but that's where he yeah. took his name from. And uh, I'm the only person here ah. who saw Bill Halley live. We'll talk about that another time. In Stevenage, time. Were, yes. In Stevenage, in the Stevenage Mecca, wow. indeed. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the sins of being a black teddy boy when there weren't any others. But apart <laughs> from that, uh, you've got... Yeah. Uh, Big Joe Turner did the original Shake, Rattle and Roll. If you hear his early music from the 1930s, he's a blues shouter because there's no amplification. There isn't amplification. Oh, right. So you mm. sing in a certain way to reach the person at the end of the, you know, the dance floor or whatever. Mm -hmm. So when you hear Big Joe Turner, he sings like this, get out of that bath and wash your face and hands. You sing to the person in the back row. Whereas Bill Haley, or Bill Halley, if you prefer, uh, goes, get out of that bath and wash your... He doesn't have to because it's amplification. And oh. when amplification then comes in in the 1950s... Microphone does the work for you. It does the work for you. But can you change? Going back up to, you know, Liverpool attack, can it switch <laughs> at that moment to be defence? <laughs> it's all linked. It's all linked. Bill, cool. uh, Joe, Big Joe Turner is still singing like that after amplification. And, of course, you right. think, like, you know, when sound comes to Hollywood, that all the uh, silent stars disappear. But, no, Joe Turner makes it work to his advantage because he's suddenly got this voice that nobody else has in rock and roll mm -hmm. or in rhythm, blues and whatnot. Uh, and that's what happened with dance music, what we used to call disco, went to the big stadiums, different kind of uh, perspective and influence the way that musicians produce music. Suddenly you can't produce music like, you know, staying alive, Saturday night fever. That doesn't mm -hmm. work in these big stadiums. And that's what uh, Calvin Harris is about. And several of the other tunes in the charts mm -hmm. in the middle of the charts at number five, though, is a ballad by John Legend. All yeah, I like me. him, but I, I really don't like this. It's, it's, it's too mawkish for me. It is the, the stuff of his that I really like, but this is this is oh, you this did? is the painful piano ballad. Get out the the the, oh, the cigarette lighter or the mobile Rich, phone. We'll or whatever come to that in a moment. <laughs> we'll come to that, and we'll, we'll ask your <laughs> missus for her view on this because she'll have a different perspective, I'm sure. Richard, John, yeah, I, I again, I'm with Tim. I quite like it. I don't actually know this song off the top of my head. So it's his biggest tune. It's his biggest well, tune. Or I, I, I didn't say I was a fan. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, you know, but I, I agree uh, certainly with Tim about the mawkishness of some of the songs. It, we don't need it shoved down our throat. I mean, we're not all happy clappy, but we don't need the mawkishness. I mean, I hate to mention it, but Taylor Swift, if she has another breakup and it leads to another five albums, I am going <laughs> to pop my clocks because I've just had enough of, oh, my God, it's all gone horribly wrong. It goes horribly wrong for everyone, Taylor. We don't need to hear your rubbish. Anyway, sorry. Actually, well, we do. Actually, we do, because you're such a great really? songwriter, in my view. Uh, what about at mm. number 12, then? A song that became uh, somewhat, you know, uh, the biggest tune on the planet for a moment. I'm talking about Happy by Pharrell Williams. Yeah, it, make, it makes me feel like a room without a roof. Of course it does. It's a great line. It's first a terrible line. It, it's a terrible no, line. First time I heard it, I it's not a room. It's, it's got I, no roof. But how it's, it's how can about it. how can I find a room for a rhyme for truth? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's so I actually but quite like the song. And, and see, I mean, it's it's not mawkish. You were just talking about no, mawkish. Not at all. This is, no, it's happy. This is the absolute no, yeah, not. exactly. <laughs> now, what was, was the B side called? Unhappy. <laughs> it should have been the dumb version. No, it, it is a good tune. I mean, it's. I think it suffers because it's obviously connected with a film, and you know, it it, it got overplayed. I'd say, but um, it's, it's a soundtrack to the World Cup for me. Movie. That one. Oh really? Twenty fourteen really? World Cup. That was the one that was everywhere. That was that was playing in all was the it? stadiums, in, in all over the stadium. Yeah. Okay, so it's yeah. a bit like. Um, Gay, you know, da, 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 which became yeah, a big yeah. one at the Euros, and, da, 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 and every club plays it now. 
let's get back to more free from though. desire i believe it's called sorry sorry yes and, and um, no don't apologize at number 20 great singer paloma faith with only love can mm -hmm. hurt like this move either of you she's it, it's it's amy territory isn't it i don't think the song's as good um, I, you're right i think it's more Adele territory than Amy Territory, and I think Paloma Faith suffered Perhaps. from the emergence of Adele. And Adele's got the more pop voice, but Paloma Faith has got just this amazing voice you can listen to over and over and over again. Um, but you're right, it's a tune that possibly um, doesn't quite do it. Anything in the top 30 that grabs your eye? I only got, up to, only got up to 20, and there were... Well, oh, we, we, even, even at this stage, it is a shame, perhaps, but you know, time, time's winged chariot and all of that. Um, yeah, of course. We, 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 were all, we were all too old for it, weren't we, really, <laughs> 10, 10 years ago? Yeah. There are things that really irritate me. Uh, some of the, the, or, the orchestration DJ stuff, I, I don't like it's a lot it. Of it. Iggy, it's a lot of it. Iggy Azalea irritates me, in me uh, oh, enormously. Yeah. It's just like a, it's like an Instagram post from, from, uh, you know, and it starts off anything which starts off telling you how real it is, uh, you know, in, in a, in a post Ali G world, I don't think deserves to be, mm. to be taken seriously. Yeah, the, yeah. The, 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 Chris Brown track loyal annoys me. I mean, we talked about, and maybe I don't have the right to do this, but for me, the N word is irredeemable. And it, it's a, it's a song that's all about N words and, and hoes and bitches and, mm. I, I, I can I can live without it. I just felt I've I've, I've wasted my time sharing that that it's, time with Chris Brown, who's obviously talented and capable of of, of something better. Yeah, although he lost his way after he, he broke up with uh, what's her name. Um, what, what's her name? I don't know. Hello, I don't follow the, the, Mrs. The Brown. Celebrity. I don't know. Yeah. No, it's, it's Mrs. 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 Brown. Mrs. You've got a lovely daughter. Oh, Rihanna. Rihanna, apparently. Rihanna, Rihanna. well done you. Yeah. Well done you. <laughs> <laughs> this I was reading the chat here all the time. There, there is one, I mean, there's a couple of great tunes that I'd like to mention. At number 79, I Need a Dollar, Allo Black. He's up higher with another mm -hmm. tune, which is good, but I Need a Dollar is still out there and still played yeah. over and over again. I think it's a great tune in any case. But also, I would like to go to number, I wouldn't normally... Um, think much of this artist. It's not in my playlist at all, but number 82, Miley Cyrus's Wrecking Ball is a brilliant track. Um, she's got talent, fair enough. She wouldn't be my choice of a singer, but Wrecking no, but, Ball but there's, as there's a always theme, kind of honest, there's an honesty about her music that comes through, I think. Yeah, 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 I would agree with you. But Wrecking Ball is a theme, you know, to think of a love relationship being like a wrecking ball you know what's coming don't you everything is going to be destroyed i thought was a genius idea for um, a song and that stands out in this chart for me not being a hit but some well it became a hit subsequent at this point though it's so low down in the charts it's probably uh, not been recognized as such but it becomes one of the standout hits from this chart i think um what kind of music do you like generally though richard apart from cloud all over uh yeah i mean dave clark five obviously my top band but um I'm, I'm i'm what they used to call an indie kid and i had this discussion with someone yesterday saying but indie's a bit broad i said well when i was younger it wasn't broad it was just hmm. the bands that weren't signed to major labels were indie so it's the punk era you know and i, I know some of the punk bands were then signed to major labels but it was that didn't quite fit into any category type of music. Stiff so, records. Stiff records, you know, you, lots of brilliant songs. And, you know, I, I I still listen to music, but, you know, so I've got, you know, kids in their 20s. So I do listen to their music and then I play them mine, say, this is better. So you better listen. And, and to be fair to them, they do often say, actually, this is quite good, Dad. You're not such an old rocker as you used to be, but you, you're fine. Um, so bands like Pixies, Throwing Muses, Stone Roses, Happy Monday, that sort of stuff. Because I was just, I missed out on punk slightly because A, I was quite young and B, I was quite scared by punks. They look really aggressive. 
and I, I didn't really understand putting a safety pin through your nose, how that would help yeah, you. I so, understand that I mean, come on. Just I mean, the... I know Vivian Westwood made a career out of it, but I'm not so sure it was that great an idea. Um, and I, I used to love the music because I thought it had a real energy because we got through that period of the 70s where everything got a bit boring and stayed. And then suddenly, I mean, obviously there were tunes that were great, but generally the the charts were full of pretty boring stuff. And then I think when punk arrived, it had such an impact. It just went bang. And you all went, That's exactly what it was. And not being very polite here. I quite like that. Yeah. And also punk had a trajectory that you would realise it didn't just go bang, but it took it because music, as you know, from, you know, uh, being a fan of indie music, it takes a long time to seep underneath the zeitgeist before suddenly it breaks through and you yeah. suddenly think boom nirvana's here you know but actually you look yeah, at yeah. what led to that there was a journey before we got to know who kurt cobain was for example so punk at this point when mm -hmm. you mentioned safety pins there was a punk poet at the time although it ended up not brilliantly for him a guy called patrick fitzgerald and his yes, big hit yeah. was yeah you remember well then you know you're punk if you remember patrick yeah. fitzgerald then no you know i do yeah, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, I bumped into him years after, you know, a couple of years after the big punk thing, walking down a street in Stockholm of all places, and it seemed quite slightly incongruous. But the last time I'd seen him before that was on the big uh, anti-Nazi League march to Victoria Park in London, where even mm -hmm. the uh, Clash were on the verge of being bottled by the new emergent skinheads who just wanted to have uh, sham 69 on the stage so they had to mm. grab jim percy to help them out on white riot but that was last time i saw patrick Fitzgerald, and he literally was bottled off the stage by all these skinheads in the front row but his big hit was i've got a safety pin stuck in my heart for you <laughs> yes for you. <laughs> see the reason yeah, that's, that's i, I do remember i do remember him because i had an elder brother so he was into punk and he was a bit older so he got involved and he actually at one point worked for the stranglers in the stranglers information service which was i think it was probably every two months they used to produce a magazine in the days when you used to produce magazines rather than it all being online and he used to be absolutely obsessed by everything involved in punk because obviously he needed to be slightly because of the stranglers and he needed to be up with so i got a very good grounding in that music without ever being directly involved in it so he used to just say right come and listen to this this is good this is but patrick was he slightly quirky do i remember him being slightly he was quirky? yeah Not... he couldn't sing to save yeah. his life so he adapted well, himself as a kind of an early kind of early 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 raw Bob Dylan, I suppose, he was more like a troubadour. And he'd come on right. stage just with his guitar and his little guy, little guy. Um, mm. And little, little guy. Voice. Little guy. Yeah, little guy. Put him in gold for Crystal Palace. Little guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> little Argentinian guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. World Cup winners, although not him, but nevertheless, I thought it was a no. great goalkeeper. Listen, let's wind this one up. It's been an absolute pleasure. Let me tell listeners that they can hear more from you on your podcast. It started with a kick. Where can we find that in all the usual podcast bases? All the usual places, and gentlemen, I'd love to invite both of you on, because I'm sure you have got great stories about the first match you went to, which is what the podcast is all about. It's called It Started With A Kick, and guess what? It's just about the first game people attended. We do go beyond that into various tributaries, but it's great fun. People love doing it. People love going back and I say, oh, I can't remember my first game. We will dig it out for you. We will find it. So... Both of you are uh, destined for this podcast. And um, yeah, it's, no as I say, I've, I've had a great time doing it. And I'm, I'm hoping that a few listeners might be having as much enjoyment as myself and my guests have. I'll definitely come on um, anytime you like. But it's an absolute Good. pleasure having you on this one. So come back anytime you like and let's talk more, whether it's about Crystal Palace or otherwise. You certainly know you're Crystal Palace. I think it's fair to yes. say everybody could hear that. But Richard, thank you very much, Richard Foster, Crystal Palace fan and host of Insight with a Kick. 
a podcast about your first football match memories. We've all got one, as he says. Talking about Chris Bull today, Tim, you had a, you, have you had fun? Have you had as much fun with Chris Bull as Liverpool had with Istanbul? Mark Machado is listening. Um, interesting to see if he managed to listen all the way through. So we'll find, uh, that we'll, we'll, we'll find that out in just a minute. Richard, cheers. <laughs> 